Thank you, Gail. Thank you, Bob. Thank you all, especially for coming. Does anybody in this room know how to turn down the lights? Short of a shotgun? Okay, somebody's going to have to get a shotgun. We can turn on these lights, turn down the lights right here in front so we can see the screen a little better. Oh, there's a panel right together. Oh, yeah, sure. Put me in charge. Pretty sure you don't want this to happen. Oh, that looks good. Is that good? Ha! <laughs> he thought I was completely worthless. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about abrupt climate change today. It's something very different than from the Al Gore inconvenient truth, gradual, we can fix it climate change that you've probably heard a lot about over the course of the last 10 years or so. I'm going to be talking about abrupt, irreversible climate change, which is a phenomenon with precedence in planetary history albeit not with humans on the planet. It's not as if we weren't warned. In 1989, Noel Brown, the director of the New York office of the United Nations Environment Program, said we have 10 years. We have 10 year window to solve what he called a problem. And in those 10 years, we set new records for pouring carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. About 16 months later, it wasn't just an individual. It was the United Nations Advisory Group on Greenhouse Gases, an entire group of people representing the United Nations, concluding that beyond one degree Celsius, and that's one degree C above the 1750 baseline, or pre-industrial, beyond that one degree which represented the absolute upper limit, which we could not cross, we may elicit rapid and predictable and nonlinear responses. So here we're talking about self-reinforcing feedback loops, the kinds of things that become like the snake feeding on its own tail, the kinds of things that you roll a snowball down the hill, and first, first that's up to us. That's up to the humans to get the snowball rolling down the hill. But then the snowball gets bigger, and it starts going faster. And the faster it goes, the more snow it picks up. And the more snow it picks up, the bigger it gets, the faster it goes. It's a self-reinforcing feedback loop that, that spins out of human control. No human's going to go stand there in front of it, Indiana Jones-like, in front of the boulder to stop the snowball, and it wouldn't do any good anyway. The second major point in this one sentence is that this could lead to extensive ecosystem damage. This is a critical point. Conservation biologists understand the notion of habitat, and I'll talk about that shortly, and I will define habitat with the next slide. This is critically important for all organisms on Earth. There is a certain habitat, a certain set of environmental conditions under which we thrive. 
another set under which we survive, and another set beyond that envelope beyond which no organism is capable of survival. For nearby examples, look to places like Mars, Venus, the International Space Station, in the absence of carrying a bunch of food, cleaning the water, cleaning the air at the International Space Station. David Spratt says the actual upper limit before we started triggering these self-reinforcing feedback loops, and I know about six dozen or so, was a half a degree, less than half a degree. Gail indicated we are at 1.1 C above pre-industrial times. We're actually at at least 1.6 C above pre-industrial times. The baseline keeps shifting. What we're calling pre-industrial keeps shifting so that recently the United Nations, which one recognized 1750 as the beginning of their industrial revolution, now uses as the baseline 1981 to 2010, thereby ignoring the first 200 years and change of the industrial revolution. I mentioned habitat. Habitat is the place or environment where a plant or animal normally lives and grows, where an organism normally lives and grows. So yes, we have human beings in the International Space Station. Yes, we have human beings in nuclear submarines. No, these are not places where human animals typically live and grow. Human animals typically live and grow here on planet Earth. And it's amazing, isn't it? I mean, you go a trillion miles in any direction and it sucks. You get off of Earth and there's really no place like Earth. There's really no place like home. So we are blessed to be at this incredible place that in, in which life evolved leading to human animals. And this is our environment. This is our habitat. This is where we can grow food and secure potable water and breathe the air and so on. <clears throat> the warnings have been coming for a long time. These assessments all are based upon business as usual. We can keep the machine going. They're based on the idea of no self-reinforcing feedback loops, no snowballs going down the hill. No release of methane that causes the planet to warm and therefore release more methane from the permafrost or the relatively shallow seabed of the Arctic Ocean. And they also include the idea of no global dimming. And that's because it wasn't until quite recently that the notion of global dimming entered the scientific arena, entered the scientific lexicon. So we go back to the fourth assessment by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change an incredibly conservative body producing incredibly conservative assessments and forecasts, and they indicate about two to four and a half C by 2100. This is, this is an astonishing number, an astonishingly high number that people think is no big deal. And then we march forward in time, and it isn't long before these major organizations are saying things like up to six C by 2050. Up to six C by 2050. How important is that? <clears throat> well, let's look at how quickly organisms can adapt to that kind of change. A 2013 paper in Ecology Letters, and again, all the referee journal literature I'm going to present is, by its nature, very conservative. It goes through a process of peer review, and that process leads to conservative outcomes. Quintero and Weens focusing on vertebrate species, conclude that required rates of net evolution would have to be more than 10,000 times faster, more than 10,000 times faster than typically observed for these species. And we're talking about vertebrates. This assessment from 2013 was written 2012 or before, and is based on these very conservative assessments that appeared before 2012. And already, it's pretty obvious that vertebrates are unable to adapt from an evolutionary perspective to the changes that are headed our way. <clears throat> the response to all these warnings is very human. We, we tend to focus laser-like on the 
on the item directly in front of us and don't pay much attention to the big picture because the, that big picture is not in our immediate field of view. We're evolutionarily hardwired for flight or fight. We're evolutionarily hardwired to survive in the immediate moment. And secondly, if we survive long enough, we're evolutionarily hardwired to procreate, to make copies of ourselves. That's how we got here. That's how every organism succeeds. If that, if that is not part of the DNA, the desire to reproduce is not part of the DNA, the species is selected against and it goes away very quickly. Flight or fight, we survive, we reproduce, and then we accumulate material possessions. Those are the big three items that evolution by natural selection drives us toward. At some point, some, some buddy in a cave took a rock outside the cave because there was this, this fear that something was out there. And he comes across a saber-toothed cat. And the saber-toothed cat goes growl, and he, and he hits the saber-toothed cat with a rock in the head. And he goes, wow, I need more rocks. Or something like that. That leads to the idea of accumulating material possessions contributes to power for individuals. And thus is bred into our DNA, becomes part of who we are. <clears throat> I want to talk about a couple of paradoxes, either one of which leads to the conclusion that we're in real trouble. And I'm going to present two paradoxes, and then I'm going to talk about even worse things that are going on. <laughs> you know, it, it's not as if I want this to happen, just to be clear. For one thing, I won't even be able to say, I told you so. Right? If we all go extinct, who am I going to tell? So that's, and that's not even the worst part of it. I want to live too. I want to live to a ripe old age and, and, and do the things that my parents are still able to do. <coughs> so it's not that I want you to die, individually or collectively. Some of you have my doubts. We haven't even met. OK, civilization is a heat engine. No matter how we run civilization, and I'll get into a few more of the details later, <clears throat> I have an interesting story about that. In my classrooms, when I was at the University of Arizona, somebody's phone would ring. And, and I would say, now's a good time to remind you to turn off your phones. And then I'd, I'd, I'd take the phone away from the student. And they're like feeling kind of awkward, so they give me the phone. And I take it, and I answer. <laughs> Hi, this is Guy McPherson. And Jan is a little busy right now. Is this an emergency? And Jan is like, oh, oh, it's her mom. How are you doing? She's in class today. She's doing really well. You know, sorry. I digress. <clears throat> no matter how we run civilization, solar panels, wind turbines, wave power, civilization itself is a heat engine. This is based, again, on the referee journal voucher. I'll present some details later. And then, as it turns out, because of global dimming, turning off civilization heats the planet even faster. Talk about damned if you do and damned if you don't. This is where we're at. Details to follow. Second paradox, geoengineering must be employed according to the most conservative scientific body on the, in the history of the planet. And geoengineering won't work. Oh, how awkward. We have no evidence that geoengineering will work and it must be employed. As if two paradoxes are not enough, <clears throat> conservation biologists are now finally admitting in the referee journal literature that we are in the midst of the sixth mass extinction. Her artist Bios is a conservation biologist. This, this paper was co-authored by Paul Ehrlich, famous conservation biologist, and a couple of other conservation biologists. Bear in mind that conservation biologists focus on Three, the three pillars of the discipline. The three pillars of conservation biology are speciation, how a species comes into existence and with what ancestors. Extinction, when the last individual of a species dies. And habitat, habitat which allows for that species to exist 
to live and to grow. <clears throat> so <clears throat> a couple of decades after scientists were writing books indicating we're, that we're in the midst of the sixth mass extinction, Ceballos and colleagues get a paper published in Science Advances saying just that. Coincident with the release of the paper, the senior author says life would take many millions of years to recover, consistent with the previous five mass extinction events, in which it takes millions of years to have a thriving, vibrant planet characterized by complex species again. And our species itself, that would be Homo sapiens sapiens, would likely disappear early on. Two years later, Ceballos and a different collection of co-authors indicates that we're in the midst of the sixth mass extinction with a title that comes not from the pages of the National Enquirer, but from the incredibly conservative referee journal literature, and includes the phrase biological annihilation. I never thought I would see the day when biological annihilation. You might as well say superheroes with tights and capes in the title of a referee journal article. This is amazing to conclude that biological annihilation is going on. As I say in the abstract, this underlines the seriousness for humanity. In the final sentence of the paper, all signs point to ever more powerful assaults on biodiversity as if what we're doing now isn't enough, painting a dismal picture of the future of life on Earth, including human life. Well, of course. Of course. Did we ever imagine that we could kill every aspect of the living planet on which we need to survive and get off scot-free? Did you ever imagine you could kill every peach tree and ultimately there wouldn't be canned peaches at the grocery store? This doesn't make any sense. Biological annihilation seems quite fitting. Let's take a look in more detail at those two paradoxes. The first of those is based on the work primarily of Tim Garrett, atmospheric scientist at the University of Utah who went through a torturous process to have a paper published in Climatic Change, one of the more prestigious journals right now, especially given the recent emphasis on global climate change. And in, the, in that first paper, submitted to 10 different journals and rejected by 10 different journals in 2007, finally published in November 2009, to a tremendous outcry from the academic scientific community. Oh my goodness, you're telling me we have to collapse this set of living arrangements that I depend upon for my money and my prestige and my house? That that has to go away? Or we're in real trouble? So the paper was immediately withdrawn from publication and was only published officially in February 2011 with responses from two academic groups lab groups that deal with climate change. Neither of them threatened the notion, neither of them really questioned the notion that civilization itself is a heat engine based on the laws, the laws of thermodynamics. Garrett was not allowed to respond to those two comments. Well, I knew this. How could you not know this? How could, how could any conservation biologist studying the subject for any length of time at all, how could you not conclude that it's civilization that is the heat engine, that civilization is driving 150 to 200 species to extinction every day? It's civilization that's fouling the air and dirtying the water and washing the soil into the oceans. It's civilization that's cutting down every tree. It's civilization that is monetizing every single aspect of the planet. If you don't think everything is monetized, try not paying your water bill for a while. About this time last year I was in New Zealand and New Zealand Air was being sold in Beijing for 85 cents a breath in steel cans. Does that pay? Pay somebody. So we monetize everything. So I knew. I knew that civilization was an omnicidal heat engine. It's heating the planet and it's driving so many non-human species to extinction. So I took action. And this is something I want to really drive home here. I am not, nor have I ever, encouraged inaction. 
I encourage you not to be terribly attached to the outcome of your actions. And here's a fine example, the stupid man in the front of the room. Left active service at the university because I knew that the whole money system, the whole monetary system, was driving us and every other species to extinction. It had some untoward outcomes. It was, it was cutting down every tree and washing the soil. It was, it was all how, producing all those terrible things. So I thought, I'll just quit. I'll just quit. I'll just walk away from civilization, as indicated by the title of my 2011 book. I will go out in the country. I'll be one, of the, one out of the 10 or 20 people who needs to grow food to feed the other people on the planet, and other people surely will follow my lead. And I'll learn how to grow food, and I'll make an outdoor kitchen that's amazing, and I'll make a, a biochar kiln so that I can capture the carbon before it goes into the atmosphere and incorporate it into the soil and make for healthy soils again. And I'll learn how to cook with the sun, and I'll preserve food, and everybody will follow. Except nobody really did. And it's probably just as well, and I certainly don't encourage people to do the same anymore. For a while, I was really driven into convincing people that they should abandon the system that is responsible for biological annihilation. And then I discovered the idea of global dimming, which indicates that if we turn off the switch of civilization, it heats the planet even faster. So, I, so now I encourage people to actually do what they love, to pursue excellence in some degree, regardless of whether it involves abandoning your job and going to grow vegetables and build things. But I got to learn a lot about goats. What's not to like? The second paradox, sorry, we're, we're still in the first paradox. Civilization is a heat engine. Turning off the heat engine of civilization warms the planet even faster. In addition to producing greenhouse gases that we all know about that are trapping heat here on Earth, in addition to doing that, industrial activity produces particulates that go up into the atmosphere and serve as an umbrella. And most notably among these are aerosols associated with burning conventional coal, the this, this so-called unclean coal. If we switch to clean coal and, say, natural gas, and we stop putting these particulates, these sulfates, up into the atmosphere, the umbrella falls down in a matter of weeks, and then the planet heats up, according to the initial literature, 1.2 degrees C, and according to more recent literature, up to about 3 degrees C. Well, that's an enormous number. We're currently at or slightly above 1.6 degrees, above the 1750 baseline. We add about 3 C to that, that takes us to about 4.6 C in a really, really rapid hurry. Never mind those vertebrates can't keep up with the slow rate of climate change by a factor of 10,000 times. And on a planet 4C hotter, all we can prepare for is extinction. Whoopsie. Seems that the crash of 2016 is delayed. <laughs> Rumors of the demise of the financial system have been greatly exaggerated. But can we put this off forever? No, of course not. And at some point, that really, really heats the planet. Second paradox, geoengineering is necessary. In fact, global warming is irreversible without massive geoengineering the atmosphere's chemistry, according to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in their latest assessment. This is a very conservative body. Each of the working groups must reach, must reach consensus before the results are released, and then the entire assessment goes through the political process and must be approved by governments. And still, in the fifth assessment, the IPCC concludes that global warming is irreversible without massive geoengineering the atmosphere's chemistry. <clears throat> Unfortunately, that's fantasy technology. Unfortunately, we don't know how to do that. Unfortunately, there's, and it's not just truth out saying this, it's not just the media, it's the United States National Academy of Sciences, 
in a European body of similar stature. And yet, desperate times call for desperate measures. James Hansen and a couple of other co-authors by title in a paper from July of this year indicate that the young people's burden is the requirement for negative CO2 emissions. Unburning fossil fuels. Like running the tape backwards. There's no known technology for unburning fossil fuels. They've been burned. We're at more than, we will never see 400 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We passed that Rubicon, we are not going back. The temperature associated with that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is locked in, according to a paper in the February 2009 issue of the Proceedings National Academy of Sciences, that temperature is locked in for at least the next thousand years. There's a lag. But when it catches up, we're done. We can't unburn fossil fuels. So we're really in this position of we have to do this. And as nearly as we can tell, it's not possible. It would require a miracle. So that's the second of the two paradoxes. The first of them is we have to shut off civilization. And doing so heats up the planet even faster. That's not the bad news. I save that for now. Arctic ice is going away. Ice in the Arctic, believe it or not, is really important for us. We haven't had an ice-free Arctic in more than three million years. Humans have been on the planet for, our species, Homo sapiens, has been on the planet about 300,000 years. 300,000 years, it's been more than three million years since we had an ice-free Arctic. And all kinds of interesting things happen in light of an ice-free Arctic. According to a paper in the very, 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 very conservative journal, Annual Review of Earth and Planetary Sciences. So the referee journal literature is very conservative. Annual review, reviews are more conservative because they rely on an analysis of the conservative referee journal literature. And Weslowski and colleagues, three of the four co-authors are part of the US Naval Postgraduate College. They indicate, given the estimated trim and the volume estimate for this period of time, 2007, one can project that at this rate it would take only nine more years after 2007, or until 2016, which was last year, plus or minus three years to reach a nearly ice-free Arctic Ocean in the summer. In September, the, the nadir of Arctic ice is reached. The lowest level of ice in the Arctic Ocean coincides with the autumnal equinox. And then the refreeze, it begins again every year, except this year when in October, the refreeze was essentially insignificant with respect to volume of ice. And so, and, and when they mention nearly an ice-free Arctic, an ice-free Arctic by definition is less than one million square kilometers of ice in the Arctic. Because it's difficult to keep track of every little ice cube, of every bit of ice that might be tucked into a cove somewhere, hidden under a tree. So that's where this expression, a nearly ice-free Arctic Ocean, comes from. As the president of Finland correctly stated with a press conference in the White House a couple of months ago with, yes, President Donald Trump, if we lose the Arctic, we lose the, the globe. That is reality. If we lose the Arctic ice, we lose habitat for humans essentially immediately. There are at least a dozen self-reinforcing feedback loops associated with Arctic ice alone. The acceleration of heat associated with an ice-free Arctic will be profound. It's already profound. We're already in the hockey stick. We're already in the exponential stage of warming of the planet. And eliminating the ice, think about, if you will, the notion of latent heat. You're at a party. You fill your glass with your favorite beverage. You put you put a whole bunch of ice in there. You fill it half full of ice cubes and half full of your favorite beverage. 
Hopefully it's not beer, because apparently that tastes really nasty when you have ice with beer. But I digress, as I so often do. My point, and I do have one, is you're walking around for a long time. As long as you have a little, little sliver of ice, just the tiniest bit of ice in your glass, the temperature of that beverage is right about zero degrees. It's right at freezing, maybe one degree. As long as you have a little bit of ice in there. And you can walk around, if you don't drink too fast, you can walk around for an hour or two at this party, and the ice will remain. A little bit of ice. That whole time, the temperature of the ice is nearly freezing. The temperature of the water, or the, the beverage, is nearly freezing. As soon as the ice is gone, there's an acceleration in warming of the liquid so that it reaches room temperature in a matter of minutes. That's how important the ice in the, Ar in the Arctic is. A warming, acidified, toxic soup of an Arctic Ocean is not something we will live through. People ask me all the time, OK, fine, 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 whatever. What's my expiration date? When I, the, the most common question I get, this happens almost before every presentation, somebody comes up and says, when and how are you going to commit suicide? That's the most common question I get. And I tell them, there's a lot of people I want dead, which probably isn't a very nice thing to say. But I'm not one of them. So it wasn't until quite recently that I started to reconsider suicide. You know, almost everybody does it when they're a teenager. I was certainly one of them. I thought my, my life was so miserable. Are you kidding me? Growing up in the 60s, 70s in the United States, what a privileged existence I had. And yet I contemplated suicide. In any event, I don't know your expiration date. And neither do you. And unless you commit suicide, you'll never know your expiration date. You'll be dead by the time it happens. Then you won't know much of anything at all. I think, based on my understanding of that whole death thing. So I don't know. I don't know your expiration date. I don't know the date at which we will go extinct. I, I think it will be soon. But I could be wrong. I've been wrong a few times before. If you want a complete list, you can start with my mom. I'm sure she still remembers. Anyway. It's like this, right? If, if we had an expiration date stamped on our heel, it would be like the, the can of tuna or peaches you occasionally get at the grocery store. And you buy it, you don't pay much attention, you just get the one that's in the front of the shelf. And then two months later, you look at it, and the, the, the expiration date is all smudged out. You can't really tell what it is. That's where we are. We don't know our expiration date. It would be nice. I'd, I'd much rather know that than my birth date. Right? Everybody knows their birth date. It's on your birth certificate if you have one. Everybody knows that you celebrate your birthday. I think it'd be really cool to celebrate our, dirt, our, dirt, our death days. Wouldn't that be better? Oh, look at the day. I got three years yet to live to this day. We better have a party. But we don't know. I do know that human animals require habitat, just as with every other organism on the planet. I refer to us as Homo calidus, not Homo sapiens, the wise ape, but Homo calidus, the clever ape, because we are really, really clever. And, and even at that, we cannot survive without habitat. We can for a while. Look at the International Space Station. Look at nuclear submarines. Yes, we can for a while survive under those conditions, but only if we're growing food somewhere else. Food is nice. This, is, this chart shows the, temp, the, the approximate simplified version of the temperature of the planet over the course of the last 2 billion years. That's 2,000 billion years, in which we've mostly spent the time at 22 degrees Celsius, or what I'll call hot house or Jurassic Park. 22 degrees Celsius. Occasionally, we dip down into an ice age. They're not very stable. We don't last very long in ice ages. 
that's 12 degrees Celsius. There's only a 10 degree difference between how we spend most of our time and an ice age. That's pretty amazing when you think about it because we've every one of us experienced more than a 10 degree change when we came in here from outside. And we're fine, right? We came in here, nobody died. I'm not so sure you're gonna make it through the whole thing. But nobody here has died because of this rapid increase in temperature. We're clever. We have clothes, we have the ability to regulate temperature. We can get along outside for, but, but it's not all about us. Even us is not all about us. We depend so heavily upon the other plants and animals on Earth for our own survival. Where do you think those canned peaches come from? A friend I'd never met, who I knew only through social media, I finally met last night very briefly, and she, she went directly from there to a store, probably because she had to buy food, and she sent me a picture, a picture of a can of peaches. <laughs> so apparently I mentioned that quite a bit. It left quite an impression, right? Talking about the death of her and her young children and everybody else she knows, and she remembers the part about peaches. Interesting. So we've been here some 300,000 years. This is the, the lifespan of Homo sapiens. This is two billion years of planet Earth. The universe is 13.8 billion years. And we've had our species here, according to a legal brief filed by James Hansen a couple of years ago, we've had our species here up to about two degrees Celsius above the 1750 baseline when it was about 13 and a half degrees Celsius. So here's the whole story. We came out of an ice age <coughs> about 12,000 years ago, and the temperature of the planet increased one and a half degrees to right there, to one and a half degrees, and it stabilized at one and a half degrees for a few thousand years. And that cool temperature, that cool, stable temperature, allowed us to grow grains at scale. Before that happened, there was never a civilization in the history of the planet. After that happened, civilizations started popping up all over the globe like trolls on YouTube. They're everywhere. Several civilizations in a short span of time when they had never occurred before. As a result of that rise in temperature from 12 to 13 and a half degrees Celsius, and then stabilizing for a couple thousand years, and bam, we start growing grains. We start having the capacity to store food at scale. And once you can store the food, you can control the food. You can control the distribution of food. And then you have hierarchy. Then you have civilization. So we're currently about right here. And we survived only to right there in the past, I suspect, because that's where the where we've had habitat for Homo sapiens in the past. So the headline seems really, really beyond the precautionary principle to me. On a planet 4C, hotter all we can prepare. That implies that 4C is some sort of magical target that we must remain below. The paper goes on to say that we're so clever that we're going to be here even after that, up to 6C above the 1750 baseline. Now we've had humans up to right here, and to conclude that we're gonna have humans to right here seems a little mm, questionable to me. But we don't know. We don't know. You don't know when you're gonna die. We don't know at what temperature, global average temperature, we go extinct. We don't know at what point we lose habitat for our favorite species. We can't know because we're still here. And when we're not here anymore, we won't know anything. So we don't know when we die. We don't know when we go extinct. I promise it will happen. I guarantee that you will die. I guarantee that our species will go extinct, just like every other species in the history of the planet, except for the fewer than 1% that are remaining right now. But they're going to go extinct, too, because it happens to every species. Clever though we may be. At what temperature do we persist? 
Sam Karana, which is two or three people, we don't know his and her or her, we don't know their name, because Sam Karana is way smarter than the guy in the front of the room. Sam Karana won't tell us the name of Sam Karana. Might be a climate scientist. Would kind of surprise me if it wasn't, if there weren't a climate scientist in that group. Sam Karana turns out these really interesting articles rooted in evidence, but doesn't reveal his or her name or names. In one of them recently, like just over a year ago, he and or she concludes that we're headed for a higher temperature than observed on planet Earth in the last two billion years as a result of adding up some of the factors that contribute to global average temperature rise over the course of the next decade. I did my own analysis and concluded taking more conservative approach than Karana in several places and concluded that we're probably headed for somewhere between the typical temperature observed on planet Earth over the, class, over the course of the last two billion years and the highest temperature observed by planet Earth in the last two billion years. And so I took this very conservative analysis because after all, we're talking about a fairly sensitive topic and I want to be pretty conservative in my approach. And I end up with there instead of the really high temperature observed by Karana or forecast by Karana in the near future. And so I want to, I want to take this apart a little bit and point out all the factors Karana points to as contributing to higher temperature over the course of the next nine years now. The first of those, the consensus at the time, a year ago, is that we're about 1.6 C above the 1750 baseline. Historical records miss about 9, about 20% of global warming, according to the Referee Journal literature. And so adding those together is where Karana gets 1.92, 1 1.62 plus 0.3. If we, if we take out that 19% and go with the consensus view of 1.6, that's a more conservative approach. And so that's what I used. There's a 10-year lag, approximately, according to the Referee Journal literature, between emission of CO2 particles, molecules, and maximum heating associated with the molecules. So the typical molecule of CO2 is emitted when we turn on a light that fires up the coal-fired power plant or turn on the com internal combustion engine or whatever that causes CO2 to go into the atmosphere and then it wanders around and goes into the ocean and takes a swim and does various other things and finally gets around to its job of maximally heating the planet some 10 years later. So that's locked in. So point three is locked in and by the same token, there's a very, very fast feedback associated with water vapor. Water vapor is the most abundant greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, and there's a very rapid heating associated with carbon dioxide release and water vapor input. So that adds 0.3. Karana makes an error here, I believe, in concluding 2.1. I think this should be 0.3. Anyway, we go through this re removal of the aerosol masking effect or global dimming, as I already indicated, adds up to about three degrees Celsius. Karana concludes two and a half. And so these are the two differences that lead me to my conclusion, excluding the referee journal literature, we get down to, or, or claiming that the journal literature is not conservative enough, that gets me down to 22.2 degrees Celsius, global average temperature. If I include those two factors from the journal literature, I get to 23. Tacking on albedo changes in the Arctic, this is just the reflectance associated with ice as opposed to open ocean. Blue ocean, as you can imagine, absorbs much more heat than white ice. Peter Wadhams has conducted more than 50 expeditions above and beneath the Arctic ice. He was the director of the, what was it called? Ocean Physics Program at Cambridge University for many years. His latest book details his understanding of Arctic ice. And he's far more radical in his book 
than he is with this assessment that was conducted in 2012. Wadham says, in light of an ice-free or nearly ice-free Arctic, we're headed for a global average warming or disruption of energy balance of more than two watts per meter squared as opposed to 0.47 watts per meter squared through the 1970s. This is a huge, huge change. From seafloor methane or methane hydrates, Karana adds 1.1 degrees. The referred journal literature indicates a little higher than that, beginning with the statement by Shikova et al. and subsequently supported by two journal papers this year. I already indicated the extra water vapor feedback is one for one with carbon dioxide emissions in the atmosphere. And further feedbacks, this is things like permafrost melting. And if, if you're tracking this issue at all, you know that the permafrost is melting far faster than expected. That all around the boreal regions of the planet, permafrost is leaking out like crazy. So this is, that's just one of uh, six dozen or so additional feedbacks. So th these numbers seem very conservative to me with the exception of this one. And yet I'm taking a very conservative approach and concluding that we're still headed for a very high temperature, well beyond the 4C, well beyond the 6C that Oliver Tickell concluded would lead to extinction in the paper in The Guardian. Lest you think we have until July 15th, 2026, before the last human goes extinct or before your expiration date is reached, I don't think that's the case. Crana conducted a subsequent analysis earlier this year and concluded if we don't just add those things up, if we don't just add up the various contributors to near-term temperature rise, if instead we take an exponential approach and forecast a curve into the future, then we may reach that critical 10C warming above the 1750 baseline in four years. And unless you think this is crazy, it was a similar analysis conducted in 2012 indicating it would be 4C above baseline by 2030. And that number seems stunningly conservative at this point. But again, this is projecting into the future based on relatively limited data. And again, we can't predict the future with certainty. I don't know your expiration date. I don't know our expiration date either. It could be faster than that before we lose habitat for our favorite species. Shikova and colleagues, Natalia Shikova and colleagues, indicated in the European Geophysical Union meeting in an abstract and a presentation that release of up to 50 gigatons of methane hydrates from, from the relatively shallow seafloor of the Arctic Ocean is highly possible for abrupt release at any time. They indicated this would add 1.3 degrees Celsius to the global average temperature of the planet. That would cause civilization to collapse because we can no longer grow grains at scale. Tack on the absence of global dimming to that, and we're up to about 6C soon, like with crop failure next year. So I'm not saying this will happen. I'm saying it's highly possible at any time. At any time means the day after tomorrow. It means next week. Maybe it's next year. Maybe it's the year after that. Maybe it's when we actually have an ice-free Arctic, and that's when we have this first methane bomb going off. Again, we don't know. We do know it's highly possible for abrupt release at any time. The paper, which was widely disparaged in the academic community for years, was finally validated by a paper in the refereed journal literature earlier this year and then subsequently affirmed by an entirely different research group comprised of a couple of dozen authors who concluded that our results highlight the complex interplay that led to distinct episodes of methane release in the past and therefore that support the notion that we could have abrupt releases of significant amounts of methane at any time. So to receive this sort of affirmation for an uh, idea that was widely disparaged by Gavin Schmidt and David Archer, for example, for years is 
quite telling, and especially given the nature of the journal in which it appeared. I already indicated that the ability of vertebrates to keep up is being badly outstripped by relatively slow rates of climate change so far. Imagine what happens if we have the crash of 2016 delayed by a couple or three years, but it still happens. And so we have the sulfates, the aerosols that fall out of the sky very suddenly. And so we have that very abrupt rise in temperature in, we're talking about weeks here, not years, not decades. Even the Pentagon indicates that American empire is collapsing, and I guarantee you that American empire ain't going to go down without a fight, without blowing up everybody else on the planet along the way. If the ship is going down, the captain is not going to say, I'm going down the ship. He's going to say, I'm taking every ship in the ocean down with me. I can't imagine the, the country of my birth acting any differently than that. The collapse of civilization, it's more precarious than we realize. This according to the cover of New Scientist published the first week of April, 2008. Some of you might remember what happened later that year, 2008, when we had the global financial crisis that nearly took down the whole house of cards. Ben Bernanke, who at the time was the chairman of the Federal Reserve System, indicated in an interview in February 2011 long after people forgot that there was such a thing as a global financial crisis. He indicated in an interview at that time that every bank except one in the United States nearly collapsed. He wouldn't name the one. They call those banks too big to fail for a reason. If one of them fails, I suspect the whole house of cards comes down. So the system is more precarious than we realized. Every civilization is nine meals away from catastrophe. Every civilization, the big box grocery stores here have a three day, maybe four day inventory. That's it. The trucks stop, the house of cards comes down. Even first responders stop responding, go home to their families and friends in an emergency. My point here, and I'm not predicting this at any time, Civilization is always three days away from utter disaster, but that doesn't stop me from flossing my teeth. What I'm trying to do is encourage you to live with urgency. Any moment might be our last, as Homer pointed out 26 years ago in the Iliad. I suspect your life will be rather short. The world's oldest human being at the time turned 117 years old in March of 2015. And when asked to ponder the first 117 years of her life, she said, it seemed rather short. She was 117, she died a few weeks later, simply to put a punctuation mark on her message. It seemed rather short. We don't have 117 years. We as a species might well not have seven years. How do you live in light of that information? Do you live with urgency? Do you live with compassion? Do you treat people like you want to be treated? Do you treat people with respect? Do you seek dignity for yourself and others? Do you seek justice in the time we have left? I think all of us would do that. I'm just here to remind you that the expiration date, the one you can't see stamped on your foot, is sooner than you could possibly imagine. And if it's not, and you still live with urgency, and you still pursue excellence, and you still do what you love, is that so bad? Is that the most horrible outcome you can imagine? I would think not. Thank you for your rapt attention. I will gladly entertain your questions for as long as we have here, which is about another hour, if I'm looking at the clock correctly. So thanks very much. Any questions, please? We don't have a microphone that we can pass around, but uh, we would ask you to speak loudly if you would, uh, and I'm sure Guy will be happy to uh, respond to any question that you individually have. Mm -hmm.
Yes. Uh, there's some talk about um, uh, the planet entering a new ice age, and I, I think there's limited interest in that or, or support, but in the event that we do enter a new ice age, how do you think that would impact the timeline that you're suggesting here? You know, there was, in the 1970s, about 20% of the people studying climate change concluded that we were headed for an ice age. And about 80% said we're headed for warming. And it's clear that the 80% were correct. But I'm reminded during every presentation that some people said back in the 70s we were headed for an ice age and they were wrong, so therefore you're wrong too. I don't see any evidence that we're headed for an ice age. I think if, if we look at the Milankovitch cycle, if we look at the long-term trends, that Earth was probably headed for an ice age and we solved that problem. I think that Earth was headed for another ice age in the not too distant future, but that by pouring greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, we overcame that quote natural cycle associated with entering an ice age. I would love to think that was the case. I would love to think we're headed into an ice age because as Homo calidus, as the most clever organisms that we know about in the history of the planet, we're really good at cold. Really good. I mean, we live in the International Space Station. We live in Antarctica. We, we carry out these expeditions to the Arctic. Why? Because we harnessed fire. Because we have this technology that we take for granted, clothing, that keeps us warm. Heat and the loss of habitat for non-human species, that's dreadful. In fact, of the, Two of the five previous mass extinction events were underlain by rapid heating, and they were the bad ones, including the great dying 252.2 million years ago, the worst of them all, the one that caused 90% of species, more than 90% of species on the planet to go extinct. The cooling events, there were three of those in the past, an ice age that causes a mass extinction event, more than 50% of the species go extinct, but they were much less dire than the heating events. Life persisted near the equator instead of near the poles, like it tends to do during heating events. But cooling is easy. Humans, we got this. We got this. And even if it's just harnessing fire, we can, we can go back to very primitive ways. What we would consider very primitive, meaning no central heating, right? And, and just skins and furs to keep us warm. And we'll be fine. I mean, that's how we live for the first 290,000 years of, the, of our species. So I'd love to think we're headed for an ice age. I don't see any evidence of any significance indicating we're heading that way, unfortunately. Yeah, Ian. Uh, can you go back to the slide, the Karana slide that had uh, the bar chart? Where the bar chart? There we go. At the top, did you have two of them? Oh, yeah, on the white side. Potential rise by 2016. What's the case for the timeline for those chunks of heating? So there's potential rise by 2026. Yeah, right. Uh -huh. I missed those. So, so we're already at about 1.6, according to consensus, about 1.6 above the 1750 baseline. We're at 1.92, according to Karana, based on the fact that we miss 19% of the warming. So, and, and so, and how do the others kick in? right, so there's a 10 year lag, that's where that next half a degree comes at, that 0.5. There's a half a degree lag, there's a 10 year lag associated with the release of carbon dioxide. So that half a degree is locked in, and water vapor feedback goes one for one with carbon dioxide increase. One for one, that's from a paper, eh, I don't have the, citation here, but it's in the refereed journal literature indicating a one-for-one one increase, carbon dioxide and water vapor impact. And it's that, that feedback is experienced in a matter of days. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's another half a degree. So now we're at 1.6 plus one, so we're at 2.6 in 10 years. The big chart is 2.5. That's right. <coughs> Aerosol masking effect. In a 10 year time, time frame. Right. 
And that's from the absence of the aerosol masking effect. If we get up to two, two is the so-called target dreamed into existence by a neoclassical economist. One is the target identified by the United Nations Advisory Group on Greenhouse Gases, but two is a number dreamed up by a guy named Nordhaus based on nothing at all except, except that's probably where civilization collapses. We probably can't grow grains at scale at 2C. And we'll be at 2.6 conservatively, not counting any of these other feet. Feedback. <laughs> Not counting any of these other feedbacks, we're at 2.6. 2 and a half is triggered by the 1.6 and 0.3 and 0.5. Exactly. Exactly. So we can't grow grains at scale under a certain set of conditions. That's strictly a cool weather phenomenon. The grains are grown at scale where? Large continents, in the interior of large continents in the northern hemisphere. That's it. Asia, Europe, North America. Other than that, we're not growing grains it's to any practical hot, extent. It's too hot, it's too dry, it's too cold, the weather's too variable, it's too rainy, it's too whatever. So. That seems I, to be the slide that hits the, the rubber hits the road. Absolutely. So, and my understanding of this, and notice he's very conservative, that's 2.5 is probably 3. given the conservative nature of the journal literature. So that is huge, and it was at that point in 2013 when I realized that my efforts to walk away from empire and encourage others to do the same and grow food for people with me, growing food for 10 or 20 other people, it was at the point of global dimming that I realized this can't work. This can't work. I, I turned my life upside down to try to lead by example to walk away from this set of living arrangements to grow food so that we would have a chance to get through the bottleneck. And then global dimming appears on the horizon. Now, it wasn't so bad when, in December 2011, Hansen and colleagues said 1.2 plus or minus 0.2 degrees. Okay, fine. I can live with that. And so can you. But up to three? That is a huge number. And this is a fast feedback. We're talking weeks. Albedo changes based on, this is the only one not based on the refereed journal literature. It's based on Peter Wadhams' work from 2012. He has become considerably less conservative in his recently released book, which is called, what's it called? It's named after a Hemingway book. Farewell to Ice. Farewell to Ice, thank you. Farewell to Ice. So he's, he's become less conservative in his book, which came out just this year. In any event, it doesn't, you know, you can disregard some of these even. You can, you can completely ignore seafloor methane. Ignore the fact that methane in the atmosphere has increased 240% since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Just ignore that. Pretend that methane doesn't matter. And we're still headed for a really, really <laughs> freakily weird high temperature over the course of the next decade. So, you know, there are so many parts here that if we just even choose to ignore some of them, it's still bad news. Check. I know it's going off. It's because it's because of the bobby pin, I think. You know, when your technology is supported by a bobby pin, I'm not sure that's really high tech. I'm not complaining. It just seemed like I was. Volcanoes, I suspect, would produce an impact much like solar radiation management, which is the most common, commonly discussed version of geoengineering. So what volcanoes have done in the past, and we have evidence from Pinatubo in 1987, is they have, that, so we're on, this, we're on this rise in temperature, what Michael Mann used to call a hockey stick that he now says is, there's no such thing, oddly enough. So we're on this relatively rapid global average rise in temperature. Then a volcano comes along, and the temperature stabilizes for a short period of time. And then it tries to catch up. It doesn't just go on the same curve it was before. It actually steepens the curve. So I suspect a volcano would help for a while. 
I'm also not proposing that as a solution. Because if your solution is let's blow up Yellowstone, then I'm not, you know, I'm just not a fan. There I, is a lot of new volcanic activity all over the world. Of course, yes. Isostatic rebound is a real thing. Yeah. You know, as, as the continents become lighter because of the melting of ice, those, we're, we're seeing tectonic, truly tectonic shifts in the plates. So, yes, volcanic activity, earthquakes, things are happening way faster than expected. Yeah? Um, from your point of view, what is the flaw in uh, our character of human nature that has brought us to this point? And it's just like, well, it's a genetic defect in us. So what is the flaw in human nature? I'm not sure there is one. Greed, maybe. Well, you know, the first 200, at least the first 290,000 years of Homo sapiens, and at least the first 3 million years of the genus Homo, is not characterized by greed. We didn't have a monetary system. Once we created a monetary system, once we created civilization, then we were done. But it's all about the civilization. Is there a fatal flaw in that? People often ask me, where did we take the wrong turn? So we've come to forks in the road and many times as a species, and it seems like we keep taking the wrong turn. Although at the time, it makes sense. Right? Harnessing fire seemed like a good idea at the time especially if you're the one shivering in the cave. But harnessing fire allowed us to prepare food in ways that made us not die from eating it. Again, seems like a good idea at the time. But without die-off matching births, we get into overshoot. Language, complex language, so that we can communicate at long distances, seemed like a good idea at the time. I'm not so sure about that anymore. Because those, those two things are consistent with the coming down out of the trees and becoming these big-brained organisms. It appears that our brains develop coincident with our language developing. So it might be that. But we didn't, you know, as individuals, we didn't have a lot of choice at any point along the way. It could be what's called the maximum power principle. It could be that sociopathy is present at some level in a certain percentage of humans, and I suspect this is the case, right? The sociopathy occurs in one out of 200 humans or whatever. And so when you're in a, in a tribal situation with Dunbar's number, say, fewer than 250 people, then it doesn't matter because you can't express that sociopathy or the tribe will throw you out. If, if you try to control people, if you try to manipulate people, if you try to even become a free rider who doesn't contribute to the community to the extent that you take from the community, you're going to be treated not very well and ultimately you're going to be banned. So I suspect that the genetically it's within us to be sociopaths. And that when we create a set of living arrangements that allows so many people to coexist in a town, a city, whatever, so that you can't keep track. Right? You can't keep track of me I can't keep track of every one of you. I know a couple hundred of you well enough to sort of keep score, but I don't know all of you. And when that happens, when we have that number of people, then certainly sociopathy assumes the reins, the reins of power. Go That's ahead. the way it seems to me. Sorry. Has there been any sort of uh, separation in terms of these prediction, predictive models of uh, civil society's contribution uh, you know, uh, we go to work and uh, we do our thing uh, versus the military-industrial complex, which when you think of uh, what's been happening recently in the States, everybody has a gun. Now, every gun that is made is going to give off carbon dioxide. And what's the purpose of it, really? It's to fight one another. And uh, when you think of, of wars that are going on and have been going on, especially since World War I, I mean, they have been mammoth consumers of right. energy of, of every description. And uh, it's even more scary when you read a book 
like uh, Jerry Smith uh, wrote, uh, up the title of which is Weather Warfare, the Military's Plan to Draft Mother Nature. Um, you know, those kind of contributing factors seem to me to need to be incorporated in these models. And because if we had peace in the world, and we didn't have wars, and we weren't fighting each other, I'm wondering whether these numbers could be reduced significantly. Well, there's no question. Smedley Butler wrote a book called War is a Racket Between World War I and World War II. Smedley Butler was a high-ranking official in the U.S. military. Did you know that Dwight Eisenhower actually in the first 942 drafts said another word? It wasn't the military-industrial complex. He took it out at the last minute to appease Congress. He called it the military-industrial-congressional complex because he knew Congress was complicit as well. But then as he's leaving, as he's walking out the door, he realizes he can't piss off the people who make the big decisions, so he took their names out. War is a racket. It's always been a racket. It's been working really well for the 1%. Therefore, we're not going to change anything. Of course, there's a lot of things I think we could do that would make the world a lot better. World peace being one of them. Well, we no. War is way too financially beneficial for a few people. The US military is not going to shut down the war machine. And I, if they did, the lights would go out in the United States, and then people would be really upset. I mean, everybody in a position of power has known since 2007, when Tim Garrett was writing and submitting his articles, everybody in those positions of power has known since then, since 2007, that civilization is a heat engine based on the laws of thermodynamics. Not the strong suggestions, the laws of thermodynamics. So obviously, at the time, the thing to do, if you want to save the human species, would be to turn off civilization. Yeah, who's going to run on that campaign? Mm -hmm. Right? I can just imagine the, the, the debate between the twin cheeks of the corporate ass with one side saying, I'm going to collapse civilization in a month, and the other one saying, I can do it in a week. Vote for me. <laughs> Come on. So war is just part of that, here and then here. Paul. Um, it's a bit hot and stuffy in this room, so the CO2 level is probably 1,000, 1,500, maybe 2,000 parts per million. You know, if a room isn't ventilated, you know, the number of people in it, it gets, the levels go up. You know, outside, nominally, average might be 400, right? So um, we haven't tried to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. I mean, you're just counting um, carbon dioxide removal methods. There's about a dozen startup companies they're all struggling for funds right now. I mean, if we have a method to remove CO2 from the atmosphere faster than we're putting it in, then basically we can avoid a lot of these problems. And, if, you know, imagine, for example, I give the example, let's put the U.S. military budget for one year to addressing climate change and ensuring that we survive on this planet. Now, I'm not saying that, that will ever be done, but if it was done, then it changes the ballgame, I think. From a, you know, as an engineer trying to solve problems, so um, you know, and there's also a lot of work on solar radiation management. Like you see, geoengineering won't work, and yet a large volcano goes off and lowers the temperature of the planet for a few years, and we know that will work, putting sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere. So maybe you can comment a bit more on how you can just like how can we make it work? If we're going extinct by not deploying geoengineering. How can deploying geoengineering make it any worse? Are we going to all die in five years instead of ten years? Like, <laughs> I, I don't understand. Or maybe you're talking about all of the other biology <coughs> on the planet. Um, if we deploy geoengineering, we might take out a lot more of that than if we don't deploy it, whether we're going or not ourselves. Well, you're taking issue with the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, not with me. <laughs> and with the European body of similar stature. They're the ones who say geoengineering won't work. I'm just presenting the information created by others. And these are massive synth synthetic documents that have reached this conclusion. We, we do have the means 
to extract carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Not at anything resembling the scale at which we're increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere every year. But none of that is being supported. I wonder why. Well, there's no money in it. The money is irrelevant, though, because it's just made up. It's just, we're just printing digits on a computer screen. We could take all the military's budget for a year, and we wouldn't, because if we did, the lights would go out in the United States in a week. If you don't kill brown people in the Middle East and Northern Africa, you don't have lights on in the United States. That's it. It's that simple. So nobody, nobody in a position of power, and almost nobody in the entire United States would think that was a good idea. Never mind being unable to use the smartphone. You're talking about no food at the grocery stores. So that's why this is a predicament. It's not a problem. There is no politically viable approach to dealing with climate change. Only collapse of civilization prevents runaway climate change. Collapse of civilization heats up the planet even faster. Should we try things? I'm not in a position of shooting anybody. But we aren't. Nothing is happening at scale. I'm not a fan, even of my own death, much less of human extinction. I would like to think we could prevent that, but I haven't seen any evidence to suggest otherwise. Volcanoes are just another form of solar radiation management. Putting particulates up into the sky is something that, according to these two bodies, would have to be done forever. Forever is a long time, especially toward the end. We just we don't have the means of. You know, we've had smartphones for about a decade. The first iPhone came out about a decade, so that was we used that as a metric for when the smartphone came into existence. Maybe it was 12 years ago, and now you can't live without one. I mean, that's that's the nature of technology. Of course, we can live without one. Of course we could, but we act as if we couldn't. And it's the same with every technology. Every technological advance comes with the notion that I have to have this now too, that this is for me too. Everybody else has one, I need one. You know, Louis C.K. does an excellent skit with this, I think, with Conan, when he talks about why he hates cell phones. And, and his, his children want, want to have a cell phone, and their, their rationale Everybody else has one. And so he says, oh, you want to be stupid like the other kids? That doesn't really help the relationship, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> but, you know, so much of this technology is this one-way street, and it takes us to the cliff, and what do you know? We're there, and nobody wants to turn off the switch. Nobody wants the U.S. military to go away and stop providing oil for Americans. I mean, some people do, obviously. But then if they, just, this is a thorny, thorny, thorny predicament. It's not a problem. It's an absolute abject mess. And I don't see any way around it. There are ways to extract carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. But we're not doing them at scale. Nobody's supporting those efforts at any sort of large scale. Why is that? Why did Steve Wozniak, instead of putting money into that, instead of using his large voice on the issue to influence the sub subject, why instead did he move to Tasmania to hang out comfortably? Who's that? Steve Wozniak single-handedly yeah. put together the Apple I and Apple II computers. He came across my message, he moved to Tasmania, he sent me an email message in December 2012, says, because of you, I'm moving to Tasmania. And I'm like, whatever. <laughs> but he, so he knows. Right? Everybody knows my, my work is freely available on public display. Anybody can find my work. They know what a dire situation this is. And the response? Just make it all about me as an individual. This is, this is exactly how we got here. Here and then there. Gail, I have a question. Um, Gail, uh, why don't you ask? So, and then we'll get Ian after. So you, um, you, talked us, you talked about humans being clever. We, you know, space stations and the Arctic, Antarctica. So we're so clever, why can't we grow grain in completely different ways that we've never conceived of before? Yeah. And feed ourselves. I mean, the Promethean attitude, right? 
right? Right? Between attitudes. We're infinitely clever. Technology will solve and will pull us out of this. So if food becomes the crisis, will we not find ways of manufacturing food without relying on the planet habitat, which is no longer viable place to grow that food? So the question is, if we're so clever, why can't we grow food at large scale in ways we haven't thought of yet? Well, maybe we can. We better think of it pretty damn quickly. And uh, part of the question is about food production. You know, the changes in the temperatures will change the food production. And are we ready for that? Now, of course we're not ready for those changes in food production. Of course not. And people tell me all the time, well, the wheat belt and the corn belt and the soybean belt that's currently largely centered in the United States and goes up a little bit into Canada will just shift north. No, it won't. No, it won't. To grow those grains requires mollusols, a certain kind of soil characterized by various structure and texture and so on. And those soils are not found in northern Canada. There will not be a shift of grains further north, and we ain't making any more soil. I mean, we can make soil, we can make very healthy soil locally. Ian is doing that at his place. That's one of the whole goals of permaculture, which I've been practicing for a dozen years, is to make healthy soil. We can do that. Can we do it at the same time we're feeding 7.5 billion people? treating the planet like a sponge that we pour chemicals onto to grow plants as quickly as possible? No, no way. That's why I thought, that's why I took the actions I took. That's why I thought intensive organic gardening was the answer. And that's why I created the homestead in New Mexico and started growing all that food and learning how to do things I couldn't even imagine I would have been doing. When I started that project, I could barely distinguish between a screwdriver and a zucchini. Next thing you know, I'm out there building a partially subterranean straw bale greenhouse and growing zucchinis, and I don't even like them. <laughs> yeah? So, um, I, I'm guessing that the depletion of the global dimming would be <coughs> the result of maybe the, um, the, the so-called burp, the Shikoma uh, methane um, burst, or the ice-free Arctic. But, it, just confirm if that's, that's the this, this sequence, and then maybe take me into the sequence of, let's say this happens tomorrow, the, uh, the 50 gigaton release of, of methane. Take me through like the, the subsequent months and when, what, what those would look like. So if we have a 50 gigaton burst of methane tomorrow, then locally there will be a rapid rise in temperature immediately, starting tomorrow. Methane is more than 100 times more powerful greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide molecule for molecule. So locally first, then regionally, then certainly within a matter of months, that would cause the temperature of the northern hemisphere to warm up. According to Shkoven colleagues, 1.3 degrees Celsius. According to Peter Wadhams, at least 0.6 degrees Celsius warming in the northern hemisphere. It takes probably about a year for full-scale global circulation, it's about a year before we have that 1.3 or maybe only 0.6 degree global average temperature rise. But remember where we grow the grains, almost exclusively in the northern hemisphere. That's where all the land on earth is for all practical purposes. Right? There's, a, there's a third of Africa, there's South America, and there's a couple of little islands known as Australia and New Zealand. But, but about three quarters of the land is in the northern hemisphere, so that's where the grains are grown. So then it's next growing season before we experience crop failure that causes civilization to fail. So if we have the burp tomorrow, if we have a 50 gigaton burst or half that tomorrow, then we have an, a warming that affects the entire northern hemisphere by next growing season, almost certainly leading to large scale crop failure. Wheat, and corn, soybeans, require a very narrow range of environmental conditions to grow, go from planting the seed to harvesting the plants. So we could be talking about July, say. July when the... July. 
I feel like I'm on the Star Trek Enterprise and I need to push this little communicator button and then I can talk to you. So July, for what, the crop so July before we experience full crop failure of, say, the corn crop and the wheat crop. Okay, and then when that happens... And then when that happens, there's no food on the grocery store shelves. There's, there's a lot less. I mean, we, well, we there's... The apples we grow here. There, there is, during the global financial crisis, 2008, 2009, the United States, needing money, sold all of its wheat. Actually, I was informed recently that that was an overstatement, that they sold all of their wheat except enough to keep the military going for a year. Okay. So the people aren't going to be fed, but the military will be fine? And how does... So then, so then we get to large-scale crop failure. If we don't have grains, we don't have the ability to maintain the settled living arrangements. Every civilization, including this one, depends upon growing, storing, and distributing grains at scale. So we'll have a lot less food, and I think, I think when the shelves become depleted, human activity is going to change pretty substantially. So that leads to the, to, yes, so that triggers the abrupt dimming process or lack of global dimming as the particulates fall out of the sky. Now, it could be wrong. I certainly would like to be. It could be that Americans, the most entitled people in the history of the planet, just decide, eh, wheat is for losers anyway. I don't really need corn. Most of that goes to feed animals anyway. And so I'm going to be a vegan starting tomorrow. I know most of the stuff I say is funny, and it's almost all unintentionally. Like when I'm talking about moving to the mud hut in New Mexico. Anyway, so it could be that human behavior changes so radically that we maintain the set of living arrangements, that we don't have the catastrophic meltdown of 452 nuclear power plants, more than 100 of them in the United States alone that we manage to maintain a civil society because we all decide to get along. And it's happened before, right? World War II suspended domestic production of every automobile for personal use in the United States for two years. So Henry Ford made Jeeps for the Germans instead and for the United States military. The thing about war being a racket is you have to benefit from both sides financially. So. You know where Fanta came from? Fanta is the most popular soft drink in Belize where I live. So I know about Fanta. Apparently I have too much time on my hands. During World War II, Coca-Cola was banned from selling Coke in Germany. So they made Fanta. <laughs> so Coca-Cola invented the brand Fanta and sold it in Germany instead. We'll do anything to make them. <coughs> to make a buck, as nearly as I can tell. And, and yes, humans clearly are capable of making sacrifices for the, for the greater good, for the common good. Yes, indeed. Will we do that? Will we do that and hold together civil society? That's the dream. Ian, and then up there. A lot of the student questions, which is good to see John, and I'll be shorter than it's going to be, just to say. Uh, I'm feeling boxed into a corner with this presentation. I've heard Guy talk four times now in a row. It's been a little different every time. Um, but we got to walk out of here starting to think about how our lives are going to be meaningful going forward. Which ultimately is a spiritual question. How I, do I intend to live my life? And, and there will be lots of Promethean efforts because we already know we want to do things the farm sector was told, get paid or get out. We invented uh, 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 artificial nitrogen, and we managed to blow lid on crop yields. Also, lots of side effects that you might not be aware of, or you might. But now, we do have those choices. And the only way I can say that we can leave here feeling um, empowered is to say that it starts with the power of one. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, I know you can. Absolutely. I know you yeah. can. 
<laughs> right there. Yeah, that's, that's one of the six dozen or so self-reinforcing feedback loops that I mentioned earlier that I didn't name by name. So that puts a lot of carbon into the atmosphere quickly. So those forest fires burn wood, which is carbon, which puts carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which is a self-reinforcing feedback loop, which causes it to be hotter and drier in the places where the, where the trees burned, causing more. And so... Somebody took issue with that a few years ago in an interview. They said, Guy McPherson is wrong about everything, including that, because clearly once we burn down all the trees, the self-reinforcing feedback loop stops. <laughs> you got me. <laughs> but we don't have any trees. Yeah. yeah. Right, so normally for, you know, I, I agree with most of your sentiment, right? But I think it almost overlooks the rapid shift towards sustainable and renewable technologies, right? So we, you could imagine the military, as we pointed out, once they realize that it's actually more powerful to be sustainable, and to, you know, and that relates to being more powerful, then I think that will that shift will catch on, and uh, kind of translates down to the rest of society. So if you if you look at the the up the up uh, uptake of sustainable technologies across the globe, and then people in countries who are singled out when they don't adopt them, now it's almost seen as a as a negative, right? So I think there is more hope kind of going on we were just talking about for humans to adapt and to um, overcome this this issue. By sustainable, do you mean sustaining the unsustainable set of living arrangements we know as civilization? Because civilization itself is inherently unsustainable. There's a reason every previous civilization has collapsed catastrophically. That's because only by living indigenously and and foregoing what we call technology, can we sustain human life on Earth? Sustainability is a myth. It's greenwashing. The US military has the biggest sustainability budget on the planet. You know who's number two? Walmart. Sustainability is nothing short of a joke. To convince you that there are things we can do, like squirrel light bulbs, to fix the unfixable. Now, I'm a huge fan of taking action, but I don't know what action you're looking for. Sustainability means sustaining the unsustainable, which is civilization. Civilization. Yeah, but if you're looking at the classic definition of civilization, it's to you know, kind of migrate, consume, and then move on again. Right? So we could redefine the, what sustainability means, and that's to no longer have that sort of behavior and live symbiotically with our surroundings, right? such as any uh, animal in nature. So if you look at the, the animal kingdom civilization, they're just fine. So if we kind of adopt their behaviors, it, it's, you know, we can you know, adhere to the idea of sustainability. I'm not some sort of you know, pariah for sustainability. I just think if we're going to take one route, that's a good Yes, route. let's do that. Sure. Let's do all of that. And let's not be attached to the outcome. My entire career, 21 years in the college classroom, in every class I pointed out that no significant problem could be improved by adding more people to the planet. And every year we added more people to the planet. From the first time I promulgated that message in front of my classroom till today, we've more than doubled the human population on the planet. Had I been attached to that outcome, I'd be crazier than I am right now. Had my, had my students actually done what I was suggesting they do, and everybody else does it too, then we'd be in half the trouble we're in today. I'm not attached to the outcome of pursuing excellence and pursuing love and remaining calm, because I know almost everybody around me is batshit crazy. I'm not looking at you specifically. I, I get the impression that People are anxious and are concluding that I am giving you the impression that there is nothing to be done. Nothing could be further from the truth. For you, personally, as an individual, I want you to pursue excellence. I want you to do what you love. I want you to do it well and more. 
You've been given a terminal diagnosis. It came at birth. It took you until you were 11 years old to realize that you too were going to die. But you're there now. You know you're going to die. How do you live? How do you live in light of a terminal diagnosis? I don't know when you're going to die. Neither do you. Do you live differently, knowing that you're going to die, actually recognizing it, not pushing it away, not assuming the dominant narrative that we can have infinite growth on a finite planet, that we're going to live forever, that we never talk about grief and grieving and death and dying and sex and bodily functions? We never have that conversation. Do you keep adhering to the contemporary notion that whatever everybody else is doing, what I should be doing too? This is me for most of my life. I want you to live with urgency. I want you to recognize that sin without action is the ruin of the soul, according to atheist Edward Abbey, the Southwestern writer. Action is the antidote to despair. Not being attached to the outcome of those actions is important. Anybody see Fury Road? Fury Road, the latest Mad Max film? Great line. The protagonist says, You know, hope is a mistake. If you can't fix what's broken, you'll... Uh... You'll go insane. You can't fix abrupt climate change. You can't fix civilization. People about tell me all the time, we need to fix this set of living arrangements. No, it's already fixed. It's just not fixed for you and me. We can't fix what's broken. We can't remain attached to the outcome. We must act. There are thousands and thousands of actions you can take every day that will benefit you, the people in your immediate circle, your community, your society. Let's do that. Let's do that with urgency, recognizing that we're still going to die. Recognizing that our species, like every other one, is going to go extinct. Still, still, let's do the right thing. You know what it is, because when you come to a decision and you have to decide between A and B, and A is easy and B is hard, you know that B is the right one. Because it's hard. That's almost always the right action to be taken from a Buddhist perspective. The next class comes in here in 11 minutes. I will stay as long as they will allow me, and I'll talk to you individually here and outside the room. Thank you very much.